My name is Patrick Allen, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And <clears throat> the project is done in southwestern Ohio with the uh, Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library under the direction of uh, Brian Powers. And the uh, cameraman today is uh, James Roger O'Donnell, who is a veteran. And uh, we have the privilege today, which is May the 17th, to interview uh, Richard Bidlack. Mr. Bidlack, thank you for doing this interview and thank you for your service. Thank you. Now, do you go by Richard or Dick? It, de it depends. My mother used to call me Richard if she if so I was in trouble. Okay. So, so uh, if I wasn't in trouble, she'd call me Dick. Okay. Do you mind if we... I don't care. You, either one. All right. <clears throat> uh, before we get into your military service, uh, let's, let's talk about your youth. When, when and where were you born? I was born and reared in Paulding County, the little village of Oakwood, Ohio, on the Oglaze River in Paulding County. And that's up in northwestern Ohio? In northwestern Ohio, across the <coughs> Indiana from Fort Wayne. And about how big was o Oakwood? 700 people. Uh, and it's still 700 people. <laughs> and what's your birth date? June 4, 34. What were your mom and dad's names? Uh, Ansel Bidlack and Vivian. Huff bid like. Huff was her maiden name? Yes, sir. And uh, about when did uh, mom and dad get married? Uh, early, in, I, I came along in 34 and they, they had gotten married a couple of years before that. Well, uh, what did your dad do? My dad was a postmaster in Oakwood for 42 years. How about your mom? Did she work outside the home? A little bit at the school cafeteria, and a, but but not as a regular job. She had, once I came along and then four more brothers and a sister, she had her hands full. So you, she had a total of six children? Yep. And uh, you were the oldest? And I was the oldest. Can you give me their names and ages as you well they, uh, then next came along i came along in, in june of 34 then my brother jerry uh was the second and he came along a year and a half after i did all right and then then came tom uh and tom uh was three years younger than me and tom was a retired state highway patrol lieutenant and he passed away with cancer about 10 years ago. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get into uh, the rest of them. How about, uh, wh who's your next one after Tom? Well, after Tom, there's Greg. And then after Greg? And then after Greg was my sister, Sandra, and then my b baby brother, uh, Kirk. All right. So uh, Jerry was behind you. That's and, right. Uh, what what did Jerry do? Uh, in Jerry in was an engineer. He was a graduate of Wright, uh, no, up in Angola, Indiana at, uh, uh, what was the name of that little college? Tri-State? Tri-State. And he was an engineer and he did quite well. He's, he's now in a assisted living facility in Buffalo, but he was, had four or five kids of his own. And it, so but, but, what, was and his Jerry, what was his wife's name, do you remember? Yeah, Ruth. Ruth. Her, her name was Ruth. How and, about, she, and she's been gone now, and he's retired, remarried. Okay, what's his uh, present wife's name? Um, gee whiz, she just, they just got, they just got, uh, I, I, I can't remember. Well, you'll remember when we're finished. <laughs> yeah. That's the way it always um, happens. Now, you say Tom passed away? And Tom passed away. Was he married? And his wife passed away. What was her name? Uh, Mary. All right. Did Tom have kids? And Tom had four or five kids, and they're uh, all st still alive. All right. How about Greg? Greg came along, and he was... Uh, a graduate of Tri-State and went to work for Owens, Illinois, Toledo area in the, in the fiberglass and glass bottle business. Okay. 
Was and, she married? And he was married, is married uh, still to Velma. And uh, they, li they live in California. And they're, they're retired out there. Do you know how many children they had? Four. And I can't remember their names. How about uh, your sister Sandra? <clears throat> My sister Sandra was born when I was 10 years old. It was right during World War II. I can very I can remember that. And uh, mom was very relieved to, to have a, a daughter because she had four sons, and then her daughter, and then her fifth son was my brother, baby brother Kirk. How about Sandra? Did uh, did she uh, get married? Sandra is was, is married and uh, to your... Bob Sapiti, C I P I T I. It was. Uh, Where do they live? They they live up east of Cleveland. And what did he do, or does he? He was uh, a school teacher and a coach, a high school coach, and and he's retired. What what sports did he coach? What what sports? Football mainly. He was a big fan. He was also an uncle to the to the uh, John and Jack uh, Harbaugh. Oh, okay. And they were related. I've, and I've met both of those guys several times at different family functions. Okay. But but Bob Sapiti, my brother-in-law, was John and Jim Harbaugh's uncle. And the uh, Harbaugh's are famous for what? Michigan football. Right. So uh, you said she was born during the Second World War? and That's right. Um, do you personally remember uh, the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor? Not Pearl Harbor, but I can remember things right afterwards. I can remember start having memories okay. as a 10, 11, 12 year old. All right. And uh, like, for example, the Nickel Plate Railroad came right through Oakwood, Ohio, on the way from Bell Fountain to Fort Wayne across northern Ohio. <clears throat> And I can still remember as a 10, 11, 12 year old, 43, 44, 45, train after train after train. And we sat there and waved at these, they were in their khakis and, and guns and trucks and tanks, just train after train after train. Rolling through town. Rolling through town. And waving, well, it, and we, and waving it at us kids. How were they going? Eastbound or westbound? I saw they were going both directions. How about uh, you, your last sibling, Kirk? Uh, is he still living? Yeah, my, ba my baby brother, Kirk. Is he married? Uh, married, very, uh, good, nice family. I just talked to him yesterday. What's his wife? He lives name? over uh, um, uh, Grove City. Near Columbus? Columbus. Uh-huh. And what's his wife's name? His wife's name is... Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, now, now my mind went blank. Okay. They have children? Uh, a son and a daughter. What, what kind of work does Kirk do? Uh, Kirk is retired from the Coca-Cola bottling company, uh, but, but, but he, he sold Coca-Cola in the Great Lakes area and was a Coca-Cola rep for the central Ohio area, including uh, Columbus. Okay. And he, sp he, sp he spent a career doing it. He's now uh, retired and lives, uh, but it, uh, So you live in Columbus? And he lives in Columbus. Uh, do, you, do you know which part of Columbus he lives Grove in? Grove City area. Grove City, okay. All right, so uh, where did you go to grade school? There in Oakwood? Oakwood, Ohio, Oakwood Elementary, and it was all one two-story building, all 12 grades. All right. And you went to high school there and graduated? Graduated there in 52, and then went to Defiance College for a year and then joined the Air Force. Did you do any work when you were in high school? Uh, no. Went, 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 to, went to Defiance College, and that was it. So and, and I'll take that back. There were two summers, my, my last two summers in high school, I worked for the General Motors Foundry in Defiance, Ohio, for three right. three months each summer, and uh, that was a good paying job, wasn't it? And it was, I was making two and a half dollars an hour, 
and didn't know what I was going to do with all my money. <laughs> so uh, why did you choose uh, Defiance College? It was close and cheap. <laughs> and you graduated from Defiance? Yep. What, uh, what in? We, what year? Uh, what, what subject did you, huh. what was your major? It, was, you, 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 it wasn't such a thing. You just got a you, you liberal got a arts? General liberal arts degree. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and you got on here, you did some trade school? No, we didn't have a trade school, didn't have a shop or anything. I played in the band. All right. In the high school band. Played trombone. So my brother Jerry played trumpet. My brother Tom played baritone. My brother Greg played clarinet. <laughs> and my sister played uh, piano and something else. I don't remember. So Kirk didn't play any instruments? You know what? I don't think he ever did. Okay. Do you ever, do you ever, your siblings and you ever go on tour with all your instruments? As a band, but not as a, not as a group of bidlags. Yeah, a big a big trip was to go up to Defiance and march down. What was the main street of Defiance? Anyway, I remember I remember doing that a number of times for parades and what. Yeah. Uh huh. How, how big was your school there at uh, Oakwood? It was all twelve grades. Well, how many were in your graduating class in high school? Twenty two, in my high school class. And there were six boys and 16 girls. You beat me because I was in a graduating class of 28, 20 girls and eight boys. So uh, yep. that, that, that was pretty good. How about uh, in, in college, did you have a girlfriend or in high school have a girlfriend? No. I dated a few times, but I didn't, wasn't anybody special. Was, no, nobody steady. So... <clears throat> After you got out of college, uh, did you enlist or were you drafted or what? Uh, I, I didn't get out of college. I just went uh, two years and joined the Air Force. All right. And then went through and was accepted to flight training. Why didn't you finish uh, college? Because I wanted to, Vietnam or Korean War was going on and I wanted to, some of that action. Um, and I, and I. What did your parents think about that? Hmm? What did your parents think about you dropping out of school? Uh, you know what? I, I don't. I think they were very worried about it, but figured there wasn't anything they could do about it. I don't know. The subject never really came up. I just got home one day and said, "I've joined the Air Force," and I think Dad went stomping out of the house, and that was the end of that. It just, well, why? Why did you choose the Air Force as opposed to anything else? Because of these two engineers that were that I was working under part time at night. When I was at Defiance College, I uh, I hear their war stories. One was a Navy pilot, and one was an Army Air. This was before the Air Force. He was an Army Air Corps pilot, which of course became U.S. Air Force. And were, he, were they in World War II? Korean War was going on. No, but were they in World War II? And at, yes, okay. and Korea. All right. And and they had just I just remember that and still remember listening to those two guys and I'm just a 19 year old kid with all ears about this stuff and I said I just thought that that would be and I had never had a chance to ride in an airplane until a, 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 a friend of my dad's flew a little air coop into a farm field near, near Oakwood and that's the first time I touched an airplane. So where did you sign up for the Air Force? In Defiance, and they sent me by bucks with a, about 20 other young guys. To uh, where? To Biloxi, Mississippi for tech school. No, we went to um, Sampson Air Force Base in upstate New York. And it was an Air Force basic training base there for six weeks. And you went there by bus? And went there by bus up through Cleveland to Rochester, New York, and, and the Finger Lakes area of New York. Right. And that's where Sampson Air Force Base was, and there's, there's nothing there anymore. Yeah. But it was, a, and, and then that was six weeks of basic training, which is just learning military and shooting and, and history. Anything about airplanes during that Not, period of time? No. 
And then, and then I got accepted for technical training, radar um, controller. And as soon as I got, I was also in the process of taking the, the physical ex exams and so forth. And guys said, hey, Bidlock, you've been accepted for flight training. So then I was shipped to San Antonio, Texas. Well, now let's, let's before you go to San Antonio, had you applied to be a pilot? Well, yes. And at, at what? While I was at Sampson. All right. But it took a while to get all that results back. In the meantime, you, you stayed in tech school. Okay. So you, you applied, and they tell you you made it. They send you down to where? To San Antonio, Lackland Air Force Base. Okay. And how long were you at Lackland? I was there for three months, and then went down to Harlingen, Texas, for a year for net, for flight training. Well, what did what did you do at Lackland? Uh, tell us. Uh, that was double timing and uh, all military and. Uh, well, double timing. You mean running? Everything we did was square turns and and square corner when you're eating and all that stuff came right out of right out of uh, West Point. Well, what was the typical day? What time did you get up? And oh, we were up at early, at least by six o'clock. And, and 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 it was just all military baloney. Well, did you have three meals a day? Oh yeah. And what time did you uh, have lights out? As I recall, it was like dark, maybe nine o'clock. And it was just same same old stuff, day after day. And went and went on for over a year, almost 15 months. During that period of time, did you get any leaves to come home? <sighs> yes. I got home I got home for Christmas in 54. When you, I was a cadet. How did you get home? Bus, train, uh, plane? Both. Um, I, I remember being, I remember several times going from Fort Wayne and Lima area to Texas by train. And the interstate hadn't been built yet. Sure. And uh, so then you get transferred from Lackland to Harlingen. And what was the purpose of that transfer? Well, one was the the pre-flight was at was at San Antonio, and that was strict military uh, history and double timing and weapons firing and uh, and history. Now, weapons Horses. firing, you're talking about uh, rifles and pistols? Yeah, light, yeah, that's it. Now, what's a pilot need those uh, Well, I don't for? know. I, at that time, I wasn't a pilot. I was a cadet. But you were going to be a pilot. But I was going to be a crew member. And, uh, and we we learned to fly, shoot the 38, the 45, hand, uh, and... Uh, any rifle? And a 30, a little 30 caliber uh, carbine. All right. So that's the San Antonio, and then where did you go? Harlingen, and which is down in, near Brownsville, South Texas. And that's, I was that's there. That's in deep Texas, isn't it? Hmm? That's in deep Texas. It's deep, deep You can't South. get any further. And how long were you there at? Uh, a year. And that's when I got. Uh, well, then I was flying the, as a navigator trainer, and we flew once or twice a week, and it'd be an all-day flight, four to six hours. What kind of plane? And it was flying? in a Convair. And it had two instructors and ten to a dozen aviation navigator cadets. How many it, engines? It, it, there's a big, big twin engine. There's a picture of one over. So it's a twin engine. And there's a twin engine. Military training version of the Convair 330. Which it had R2800 piston radial engines. The Convair, what number? Three? 330, three, 340. Uh, Convair 340. Right, and the Convair 340, is that a commercial plane? Well, that was the commercial designation. Okay. We The Air Force called it a, a T29. How many training uh, flights did you have on that? We flew, we, we would fly a couple of times a week for a year. And between, flight, between training flights, what did you do? 
we, uh, we got into avionics quite a little bit, tearing down radios and putting them back together, and and uh, celestial navigation, learning celestial navigation, Loran, long range aerial navigation, drift meter, uh, just uh, just uh, navigator. Um, uh, training and learn how to read maps and and, uh, and flight planning. Okay, and that was about a year, a little over a year. So then, and then, then in April of '55, I got my commission as a second lieutenant and as a navigator. And then I came up to Waco. No, now the Korean War is over by that time, isn't it? No, it was, it was, well, 53, 54, it was just getting over. All right. Yeah. But I was considered in during the Korean War conflict, so I, that's the reason why I was able to wear the National Service Medal. All right. Um, Did you ever go over to Korea? Hmm? Did you go over to Korea? No. Um, it just meant that you were in service during Korea. Where, National where, Service Medal. Where did you go from uh, from Harlingen? From Harlingen, went up to Waco, Texas, and learned how to use air-to-air -air radar in a B-25 in the back, and it was a, a, a instructor, navigator, radar observer, and two students in the Bombay area that was closed in, and a, and then and the, and the gun was taken out of the nose of the B-25. And we, we flew at least two and sometimes three times a week for three or four hours in central Texas practicing um, lock on to and chasing and, and practice firing uh, against another B-25. And we're just two B-25s trying to shoot each other down. With live ammunition? No, 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 no. no I didn't think no, so. No, no, no. With the daytime? Just and some night, but mainly day. But but it was an all-weather interceptor, and it was a new business in the Air Force because this was after World War II, because there was no really much radar during World War II. But but it was coming into the inventory. Well, tell me about these practice flights where you're trying to shoot each other down. What, what did that consist of? What was what? When you were trying to shoot each other down in these practice flights, what did that consist of? We would we would be in touch with ground radio intercept, GCA, GCI, and they would contact us and says you have a target. Uh, you have a target at your 12 o'clock, or your 10 o'clock, or your 2 o'clock, a flight of two or a flight of one, uh, and and you start sweeping with your radar, and and boom, you get a blip. And you locked on and engaged the, the fire control mechanism, and it would lock into the autopilot on the airplane, and uh, and it would steer you into a position where you, where you could uh, fire on. And now we didn't fire on; we would we would fire, but it wasn't shooting anything. All right, and. Uh, <clears throat> Um, we, we just would just practice intercept day and night from different angles. Okay. Uh, I guess the the old Hughes fire control system and that fire control mechanism was pretty new because the end of World War II we were just starting to get air to air radar, but it was pretty primitive. Now, what kind of plane were you flying when you were doing these practice uh, air to air? Combat. What kind of plane were you flying? Flying the B-25. Okay. But later on, I got I got I finished that school in Waco, Texas, and was sent to uh, Georgia, and uh, got checked out in the back seat of the F-89 Scorpion, and and that's and that was armed with. 2.75 inch air to air rockets. And that was a jet plane. And that was a twin engine <clears throat> jet fighter, Northrop. And I was in the back seat. 
And I did that for a year at Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and then I spent a year in Iceland in the F-89, and then I came back and was sent to pilot training. So what did you do up in Iceland? Same thing. It was, a, it was an interceptor. We had a, an interceptor squadron up there. And, and we, we were on, on alert duty. Uh, two to four airplanes in the alert hangars. And uh, we would almost daily, we would get scrambled out of Iceland, go straight north for a couple hundred miles, and then we'd see these Russian bombers out there, and they would turn at us and they'd wiggle their wings at us, and we would set up to, to lock on, and, and, and they would turn around and head back north. And we'd turn around and head back to Iceland. This is during the we Cold War? We did that War. for a year. That's during the Cold War? Oh, yeah, the height of the Cold War. Did you ever have any uh, combat with any of those Russian no. planes? But it, but it was tense. It would get, it, 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 they'd, they'd turn on us, and we could see their guns come pointing at us. It was the old TU-104 British, or... Russian bomber that was copied after the T-29. And uh, they, they could sit up there 25 or 30,000 feet and be up north of the Arctic Circle heading our way and we could see them out there ahead of us. So we would lock on and then they would turn around and wing, wiggle their wings at us and head back north. Okay. And then we'd do that day after day after day for, a, for several years. And you were up there for a year. I was up there for one year. All right. And uh, after, after Iceland, where did you go? Uh, I was I was brought back to the states, to to uh, Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, where I had been three years earlier, from from tech school. So uh, anyway, I went I went spent a year as a squadron administration officer at Keesler, and then I got accepted for pilot training. And uh, and then I went through pilot training in Laredo, Texas, and uh, got my... Did you get your wings in Laredo? Pilot wings. Pilot wings. So then I started flying interceptors again, but I was doing it from the front seat instead of the back seat. Well, how long had you been in the service by that time? Well, by that time it was 1960. I'd been in for five or six years. Well, how many years had you signed up for initially? Uh, you, you, you automatically were in for four years. Then at the end of, as you approached four years up, you could renew, and which I did. And, and where were you when you were given the opportunity to renew? Came back from Iceland and was sent to Mississippi as a technical, as a squadron administration officer for a year. And then I got accepted for pilot training. And is that when you decided to re-up? And yes, somewhere in there. So... Uh, and I did that, of course, several times for the next 15 years. So what, what plane were you uh, training in when you were accepted as a pilot? Uh, flew the F-86. 86D and L, and then later on the F-102 Delta as an interceptor. How many engine? How many jet engines were? They was all single engine airplanes. Single. So, did you have any uh, mishaps when you were doing your jet no, training? No, really didn't. Uh, never scratched an airplane. Never scratched an airplane. I. Uh, any near misses? Uh, yeah, a couple times later on when I was an instructor pilot in F-86s, I remember one time I had a, a, a German, this was a 1950, let's see, 59, 60, 61. I had been a flight instructor in F-86s for a year or two. And we were training, at that time the Air Force, the U.S. Air Force, had no F-86s. But we had a squadron of F-86s, and we were training Germans, Japanese, uh, Vietnamese, uh, Japanese, Greece, Chinese nationalists. 
because we had given our F-86s to them. So the U.S. Air Force didn't have any F-86s, but I was in <laughs> one of the last Air Force squadrons to fly the F-86. Well, why had we given all the F-86s away to the other countries? Because we were replacing them with newer airplanes. What was it being replaced with? The F-102 Interceptor, the F-106, the F-101B Interceptor. And how, did those, how did those compare with the 86? Well, those airplanes were supersonic and the F-86 was not was almost supersonic. It went I went I went the first time I went supersonic was an F eighty six. But you had to be at forty thousand feet downhill in afterburner and you only went supersonic for a minute or just a few minutes. And as the air got more dense at say twenty five to thirty thousand feet, you could no longer be supersonic. And because the airspeed is deep slowing down. And and I remember a couple times getting uh intercepted by a German pilot one time um, and he was coming in on my wing and came up under me and I told him to I told him to join up on my right wing and, he, and the other guy came and he come boom and he hit underneath my airplane. Oh he actually came in contact and, with and you? That, and that gets your attention when you get hit by another airplane. Okay, he came in contact with you? Yeah we went kaboom and I said oh hell. <laughs> well uh, I declared an emergency and we both we got the airplanes uh, Got on the ground in an emergency, but there was no damage to either one of them. Okay. But I got it. But we did have a couple. Of, but no, to, to answer, actually, I, uh, in the 15, 20 years I flew airplanes, I never put a scratch on one. Well, why, why was the German flying at the same time you were? Well, this was after the war. Yeah. And they were, of course, they went back. We were teaching them in Texas to fly the, okay. the F-86, and then they went back. And then that I spent, I told you about spending three years in Norway on the NATO staff. Well, you haven't yet, but. Uh, and, uh, oh, I thought we were talking about uh, Iceland and, and Norway. We haven't talked about Norway yet. But anyway, we, uh, we. Uh, but you, you were sent from Iceland, you went down to Texas. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm getting a little bit out of sequence here. You were, you were, you're we in were Iceland. Flying, we were flying F-86s, and and I had, and we we had trained. We were training German and Japanese and Chinese nationalist pilots in Texas. In Texas. All right. Then, um, how long were you in Texas, training these other? About nations? four years, and that's when Vietnam was building up. And then, and that's when I joined the the, the voodoo, the RF-101 reconnaissance voodoo, and well, went no. to Vietnam. Uh, what about Norway? When were you in Norway? I was in Norway from uh, 60, let's see, uh, I got to think about this just a second. Take your time. Uh, yeah. 19... 70, 1969 to 1970, 70 or something like that. You were in Norway? Yeah, for and three years on a NATO, on a you, NATO staff. Okay, now what, what did you do when you were in Norway in the NATO staff? Well, I was a reconnaissance, uh, reconnaissance officer for tactical reconnaissance for NATO. Were you flying? And I, I wasn't flying an interceptor, I was flying a, a conveyor, back to a conveyor. And we had, it was a VIP airplane, we had two of them at the headquarters. And that was an additional duty I, as, a, as a fighter pilot, instructor, and we had bomber pilots and we had tanker pilots on the NATO staff. And I flew maybe once a week, a couple times a month in the convoy, flying generals and colonels around and, and, uh, in, in Europe. Now, where, where, what, uh, what town were you near in uh, in Norway? Uh, outside of Oslo. Okay. Did you get into town at all? Oh, yeah, I lived in town okay. and took a, and commuted to to the office, which is about ten miles out of Oslo. How did you commute? Did you sometimes I drove my own car, and sometimes I I got on a, a a train that went out to the headquarters. And how about when you were in Iceland? How did you get around? 
We didn't. We were we were pretty much told in that year that I spent in Iceland. The Icelandics did not like Americans being on their soil. And we were in the year that I spent in Iceland. Uh, we we had to be off the streets by ten o'clock at night. We had to be in a Class A uniform, and and you could not close up a bar. You had to be off the streets. They figured that we were only slightly less of a problem than the Russians, and uh, they oh, just really? the, the the Iceland is very socialistic today. So you say you had to be in a what Class A uniform? Class, what was yeah. that? What was a Class A uniform? Yeah. The blues, I mean, you know, a coat and tie. Okay. But did you ever experience any problems with the I Icelandic people? No, not really. Uh, it, they said they said we did, but we thought we thought they got along fine. But uh, for example, there was no, there were no blacks allowed to be stationed in Iceland when I was there in the Air Force. There were no there were no Negro people in, at the base. And and I, did that change? And the it? other thing is they liked uh, they they didn't like it was uh, the the Russians were in and out of Iceland quite a bit the fishing fleets. Okay. And we'd run into them, but we were off. We'd we'd stayed across the other side of the street, and just the 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 Norwegian the the Icelandics in 1950 in that time period um, did not they did not trust the Americans or the Russians, but but we were slightly less of a problem than the Russians were. Hmm. Well, why why did we have a base in, uh, in, in anti-submarine patrol? All right. That base, it, when I was honored as an F-89 uh, navigator observer, and we were intercepting target, we were also um, <clears throat> had U U.S. Navy had a had a P-2 Neptune squadron of anti-submarine patrol airplanes. And uh, they were constantly intercepting Navy ships. Were you on one of those? No, no, I never did. All right. How did you know they were contacting ships? Because that was their job. That's, that was that did you see big four-engine airplane that had a big long tail in the back, had a big antenna, under, and it was tracking submarines. Did you see reports of those flights? Uh, indirectly, yeah, yeah. They just they just would brief us in the mornings or whenever we went on duty that another submarine was was detected uh, 200 miles north of Iceland or something like that, and we were constantly being intercepted. So did, and yeah, there's a there it is. So you went from Iceland to Texas and then you went to uh, Norway, and what were your well, duties in Norway? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute after. After Norway, oh, we're in. We're well, getting. And then to, I retired. We're getting to Norway. Yeah, you're in Norway, and you were there for several years. Three years. And uh, how did the uh, Norwegians treat you? Fine, we got along great. Do you have any blacks or Negroes with you then? No, that was a different deal. That was in Norway and Nor Norway and Iceland. But in Norway, you could. Yeah, with Norway, we had our own house, and we had a, we had a great rapport. I worked, I worked for a Norwegian Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. I was still a major then, and he, and he, uh, and we, and on that NATO staff, we had Danes, British Air Force, Royal Air Force, uh, Germans, uh, Luftwaffe. And, and U.S. Air Force, U.S. Army, and U.S. Navy, and the staff. How'd you get along with the Luftwaffe guys? We we got along great. We got along. Any great. any conversations about no. what had happened during the war? Told war stories just like anybody else did. 
we would tell a war story. But we, but, but uh, we look back at it, and we were all professional military people, so we didn't. That wasn't a problem. Yeah, no, no grudges were held against the Germans, and and vice versa. No. Uh, we that, had we had some interesting discussions sometimes. I remember one time I was doing a NATO war games scenario up in northern Norway. And we had U.S. Army, U.S. Navy. Uh, we had U.S. Navy and, and Norwegian Navy. We had Italian, Alpine Battalion came up from Italy up to northern Norway and we would do these w war games. And I was uh, briefing uh, this one area I had a room maybe this size with a big wall map and, and uh, was briefing a bunch of German generals and admirals who was one to observe the war games from up on a mountain and I, was, and I said one of the options is to go up on mountains whatever it was and uh, you'll be able to see down in this pass, and so and the Italian Alpine Battalion will be on the aggressive section instead of the uh, instead of the instead of the defense. The, uh, yeah, and uh, I said and it might be a good good place to see. And this this admiral, this British uh, admiral, come over. He says, "I think I go see Italians." This I have never seen before when they were on the aggression, because if you remember, the Italians were, uh, were were working with the Germans during World War II. Right, right. Well, this just German admiral said that he had never seen the Italians on the aggression. <laughs> <laughs> well, did any of the uh, pilots there that uh, were were in training had any of them flown with the Luftwaffe in World War II? Uh, yeah, um, early on, but later on, uh, but yeah, they, they did. Um, they kind of ran out of airplanes, didn't they? But yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I had met a, a couple of German pilots that, that had been flying during World War II, but uh, yeah, and I, I knew, I knew guys that were um, veterans of D-Day and a lot of that stuff. All know. right. Any interesting stories about fellows that talked to you about D-Day? Did you recall? Uh, not very much, but I do. I do remember this one uh, U.S. Army full colonel was on a staff with me, and he he was at the at the Battle of the Bulge. Okay. It was real cold. Yeah. And Terrible. he says, you don't know what cold was like. Yeah. And he talked about how miserable that was. Yeah, I, 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 quite, a, quite a bit of that. So... Uh, I, I, I do remember that during some of the NATO exercises up in Norway, we had Luftwaffe flying at that time, you know, the, after the war. And the British and the German Navy was in submarines off the coast of Norway, but the Norwegians would not allow German army people in Norway after World War II. And when I was in, they said no more jack boots in my country. <laughs> so it was okay. I remember being down in a German submarine in Oslo Harbor and being shown around. And I was a little disappointed because it was kind of smelly and dirty and cluttered. And I always figured how military they were and all, they didn't clean. Uh, but the Norwegians, you know, the Norwegians were occupied during World War II by the Germans. Right. And, and in the 60s, when I came back from Vietnam and was sent to Norway, uh, they... The, the the Norwegians did not like the Germans. They just uh, the Air Force was okay, the Navy was okay, but no jackboots. So
So you were in Vietnam before you got to Norway? Yes. All right, well, we, we, jumped, we jumped from uh, Iceland uh, to Norway, and uh, how about Korea? You were in Korea? Now, was that I spent before, a year uh, in Korea. The last assignment I had, I had uh, after Norway, I came back to the States. I was in Norway. Norway was a three years. And I was coming up on my 20 years, but I still had some time. And they said, we're going to send you to Korea. And I said, I, hell, I just got went from Vietnam to Norway. Yeah, but we're gonna, we, wanna, we want you to go spend a year in Korea. And I really got pissed off, and I, uh, that's when I told the Air Force to go to hell. You didn't go to Korea? And I did go, <laughs> but I didn't get promoted to lieutenant colonel. Okay. Uh, so what did you do in Korea? I was ran a, a command post up on the DMZ. That was a shitty assignment. And the DMZ, for somebody that's going to be watching this years from now was what? And um, the demilitarized zone? The demilitarized zone and we had a right on the DMZ just south of it just was a, a gunnery and bombing range that was used by the Japanese, by the US, US Navy, US Marines, and uh, and the and the Koreans. And uh, I was one of the range control officers. I'd go every morning in my, in my Jeep and my driver and my radios, and there was about four or five of us doing this at different times. Any one time, there'd be one or two of us. And, and you're in radio contact with the F-4 fighters or the F-T-38, the, the Koreans and, and Japanese pilots, Navy and U.S. pilots. <clears throat> and we would, we would clear them in on a target and they would do bombing runs. It was, a, it, was a, it was a live gunnery and bombing range, blowing things up and so forth. You stand up there three or four miles away with binoculars. And, uh, and uh, it, was, it was an interesting year, but it wasn't a fun year. How did the Koreans uh, treat you? Oh, the Koreans loved us. Hell, we were giving them everything. Did you get into town or anything? Oh, yeah, quite a bit. What what kind of entertainment did they have in town? You know what I don't I didn't go to entertainment much. We went to the club. I, I was a member of uh, the base club at Osan Air Base uh, outside of Seoul, and uh, up just south of the DMZ was uh, Wijan Bu. Uh, anyway. Uh, we 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 had our own bars and clubs and right played poker and raised raised hell and how was the weather there and it was it, it's, I, I, South Korea and North Korea is not pretty country I don't think how it's rugged with, and rough how cold. compare with Norway uh, temperature wise no Norway was probably about the same but it was, it was a, a much more It, it was, it was, I enjoyed Norway. Once skiing, all that kind of stuff, you know, snow skiing. And, Did you do uh, any of that in Iceland? Skiing? A little bit, but not much. No, Iceland's pretty flat. I mean, there's a few, but no, we didn't, I didn't do any skiing at all in, Nor in Iceland. I just did in Norway, I did a lot of skiing. How was the food at all, food at all of these assignments uh, that you had in Iceland, Norway, Korea? Oh. At Korea, I didn't think much of the food. Later on, there's there's some pretty good food comes out of there. But it, 30 years ago, uh, Norway is considered a pretty good place to eat, but nothing like uh, Europe. You know, England, Greece, Denmark. Um, so we had we had some good good Danish meals. Smorgasbord, you know, Norwegian uh, Danish smorgasbord. I was, you know, and they had good beer and good, good booze, and yeah. Now, uh, uh, before we get you to Vietnam, are you married yet? By that time, I got married when I came back from Iceland. Iceland. 
All right. And, and, that, and, and, and went to Iceland and went to Vietnam. pilot training. And yeah. uh, what was your wife's name? Betty. Uh, when did you and Betty get married? Remember the date? Yeah, I got married in uh, when I came back from Iceland, uh, 56, 57. All right. Uh, did you and Betty, where did you meet Betty? When I was in radar school in the old B-25 at James Conley Air Force Base in 50, in the summer of 55, I met her going to Sunday school. Okay. And, uh, and uh, we stayed in touch, and then I was shipped to Iceland. And we got married that year I came back from Iceland. So did you and Betty have children? Yeah, three. Uh, all right. Uh, what were your kids' names with, uh, with, well, Rick, with Betty? Rick was my, is my oldest son, and Rick was born... When I was at Graham Air Base in, in Pan Antle, Florida, I was learning to fly, and I was a, of course, had been in. So we got we got married when I came back from Iceland. From Iceland, and was and was at Keesler Air Force Base, and got my assignment to pilot training. And my son was born that that fall of. Uh, 78, I think it was, yeah. All right. And then my second daughter was born two years later. I was at, up in northern Texas. What's her name? As a flight instructor. Al, uh, Leslie. All right. And Leslie lives out west. Her where's, husband. Where does, where does Rick live? And Rick lives in Seattle with his wife. Do they have children? And they, and no. I have no grandchildren of my own, but we had the, we had, we had, we had a, we have a good relationship. What what did Rick do as far as Rick was one of the first first off when he when we got back he was uh, got into music. We bought a, uh, a a very nice piano, and he got a scholarship at Bowling Green in music. He ended up with his Ph.D. in music out of. Uh, University of South Carolina at San Diego, and, Bowling and he's Green. got his own business uh, uh, band and so forth, uh, and he's uh, in, in Seattle. And Bowling Green is Bowling Green, Ohio. Bowling Green State University. He's has an undergraduate degree in music. Right. And, and then my youngest daughter, Allison, was born uh, while I was flying F-86s down in Texas after after Vietnam, and he. And she, uh, she went to the University of Chicago and finally got her degree in uh, archaeology and teaching. And she was uh, at the University of, no, I, unless my, my youngest daughter is a graduate of University of Michigan. And uh, I guess that's it. She married? Yeah, she's married. What's her husband do? What's his name? You know what? They just got through a divorce. Wow. Uh, they were up in Norway, up in Iceland, Alaska, up in Alaska. And she got a job as a professor at the University of Alaska. And then finally she applied for a job, and she now works as a research as a research professor at um, in, in uh, Alaska and what was her husband's name uh, she they just got a, uh, they just got a divorce about a year ago his name was uh, how come I can't remember what, what did he do? He worked as a for the Fish and Game Commission of Alaska. Okay. As a wildlife biologist, and in fact, that's how they met, because Allison was a wildlife biologist, and came back and then went back up there, mm -hmm. and they got married. 
Both of them had their PhDs in wildlife biology. And your first daughter, uh, did she marry? Leslie is married, and her husband is a truck driver. Okay. He's getting ready to retire. She work outside the home at all? She she still does. She works there in the Tacoma area. All right. Yeah. So uh, you, your current wife is Christine. So what was Betty's maiden name? Christine's maiden name? No, Betty. Oh, Betty McGee. McGee? M-C-G-H-E-E, -E, McGee. Okay. And uh, did that marriage terminate in divorce or yeah. death? Yeah, divorce. divorce. And when did you and Christine get married? We got married when I, when I, oh, when I. I've got down here April 9th of 89 or 90. Yeah, 89. 89. And what was Christine's maiden name? Misky, her name was Mac McDonald. McDonald? McGee and McDonald, do you like McGee the Macs? McGee and McDonald. Yep. And <clears throat> where'd you meet Christine? She uh, worked for me as a bookkeeper after I'd been divorced for, I'd been divorced for 20 years. And, uh, and I needed a bookkeeper. I had opened up Bidlack Aviation at Springfield Airport. I was an aircraft dealer and had a flight school and I had a half dozen mechanics working for me. And I needed a bookkeeper and I had gone through a couple of bookkeepers but I couldn't find anybody that knew what they were talking about. And finally a banker friend of mine said, I think I know a gal that might work for you. And she had gone through a divorce and anyway, uh, she was the first one that got my books right. Uh -huh. And uh, it's where I could understand what the hell was going on. <laughs> and, and it worked out great. And then we finally, after six or seven or eight years, I don't know, it was maybe longer than that, we dated a few times and finally got married. Good, good. And it's just been great. And Springfield Air Base was in uh, Springfield, Ohio. Springfield Airport, yeah. Ohio, yeah. Well, let's uh, let's let's go back in time. And uh, when did you find out you were going to go to Vietnam? I knew I was going to go to Vietnam when I got checked during the Cuban Missile Crisis in '63. Um, I had gone to the War College. Squadron Officer School at, at, at the Air University in, in, in Montgomery, Alabama. And I had been flying F-86s and 102s, and then I got, when I got back, I was no longer current because I hadn't flown an airplane for three months. And uh, it, things were ginning up in Vietnam, just starting. They said, you know, a, a good assignment, and they said, we're just filling them up six new squadrons of RF-101 Voodoos. We need experienced pilots. We need, we can't use second lieutenants. We need captains and majors because it was a more complex. And you were in that airplane alone at 1.6 Mach airplane. And so we were all were pretty experienced pilots. And I... Uh, but you'd never flown that fast, had you? Or no, had you? no, the 101 was a pretty fast airplane. Still is. I flew the 102 and the F-86, but the F-10, the 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 RF-101 was, was a faster airplane, and we flew at below 500 feet uh, on the over a target, usually around 200 feet at 600 knots, Ooh. taking pictures, and just <laughs> we had all kinds of cameras on board the airplane, and, and we were unarmed. Hmm. So I got I got that assignment to Masawa, Japan, I was sent up to northern Japan, and right after I got there, we were transferred uh, a third of us, of the squadron, to Saigon. Okay. And then for the next three years, a third to a half of the squadron was in Vietnam. Here's a little pointer. <laughs> oh.
which which way you're trying to do. Right here. Jim, can you get this? Yeah. Okay, show us where you landed, show us. Saigon. Well, when I first came, we came to Saigon. And for the first six months of a year, in and out from Japan to Saigon, a, a half to a third of the squadron. And there were two 101 squadrons in Southeast Asia. One was in Okinawa, and the other was up in northern Japan. And between us two squadrons, we always had two to, to a half dozen airplanes in Saigon. And sometimes we were flying out of um, Da Nang. The DMZ's right there. Well, what what were you doing uh, when you were we flying We were keeping out of track of this all this traffic coming down from North Vietnam. The foot traffic and the uh, military uh, traffic? Truck, truck convoys. Truck traffic. Bringing military stuff down into Cambodia, Laos, and South Vietnam. And and we were keeping trying to keep track of it. And then we were starting to, sh I say, we would lay on a target, but I couldn't take, because I couldn't shoot the target down, because we had no armor. We had nothing. To, we would, we kill them with film. Mm -hmm. uh, well, was, was, was there any orders that you couldn't fire unless you were fired on? No. There was no such order. If I was being shot at, but we had, we couldn't shoot back. Hell, one anything. No, aim, no uh, armament. I had no. Yeah, we were unarmed airplane. All right. So, did you ever uh, fly over the Ho Chi Minh Trail? Hundred times. The Ho the Ho Chi Minh Trail was a whole bunch of pla came, places. Mainly came down. Well, through Laos. A lot of it over in over in here too in Laos. Mm hmm Down through Laos, and into here, and then they could come down through the mountains. And down through here, and yeah. So you're doing all these missions and you're keeping track of them, and what are you doing with the information you're getting? When we come back into Da Nang, uh, into Saigon, or, or Da Nang, uh, and later on we were up in, uh, they come from, uh, here's Am Kai. Yeah. And, uh, you plant thing? Up in uh, northern, northern they, they Laos. Coming down into here, and and they'd get pictures, and we, and then they would send fighters and bombers after the targets, and we'd go up the next day and take post strike photography, and it was constantly fluid. I mean, it was just changing constantly. But we never were in Laos in Cambodia. Theoretically, we were in Laos quite a little bit, but 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 talk to Henry Kissinger, and he'll tell you that we were never in Cambodia. And I, and I would stand there and look at him and says, "Henry Kissinger, you're full of shit." He 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 said we were never in. I I I've got pictures of of Cambodia, but we were denying it. So, you would do uh, filming after there had been a. An attack on the or or before an attack before and after yeah pre strike and post strike and uh, what what were some of the uh, pieces of equipment that you were photographing post strike truck truck farms big truck convoys coming down uh, as much as anything but there were also bridges then there was a big there was a bridge in Vin. And, a, and an airfield that we bombed, and they could they could have a back running in the day. Really, it, it was amazing. What and was we, the bridge it, made we, of? Just, just gravel, lumber? but they could they could get them resurfaced and put put asphalt on them, and those MIGs were flying them again. Uh, and a lot of times, then it was the air to air uh, uh, missile, a ground to air missile. And those were scary. Mm -hmm. Those damn things would take off and go go guidance. And they'd go up to point two and point three Mach. And, then, and they could, once they started chasing you, you you better be doing something pretty quick about getting getting the airplane out of there. Or you're going to get hurt. So were you ever uh, attacked by yes. ground air missile? Yes. But, but I was I was lucky. Each time I did, I was able to get out. And and uh, what kind of plane were you in? The Voodoo. 
the RF-101 Voodoo. And uh, how fast were you, would you go to get a, away from those rockets? As I'd go into missiles, I'd have to burn them, wouldn't even worry about it, just as fast as I could get and roll the airplane inside down and head for the deck and get right on the deck and start moving fast. And, uh, you know, and jinxing the different... And, uh, How close did one ever come to you? Probably some that I didn't know. <laughs> um, a mile or two. All right. They they were and the other one was small arms fire. They had a way of over a target they could hear us coming, or through their radio systems and so forth. And and they knew that there was a, an airfield down there or a port or a highway or a bridge. <clears throat> And they'd have a bunch of soldiers down there, and they would just take all their rifles, maybe 30 or 40 or a half dozen or, or a dozen Vietnamese officers, soldiers, and just pull their trigger. And they would just fly through the stuff. They didn't have to aim it. Just put a curtain of fire up there. On just you. send a curtain, and we would fly through it. You know, and a jet engine is pretty susceptible to, to being to small arms fire. So there were times when I'd come back from a flight, and I'd say, how's the airplane? Lieutenant or captain, or I wasn't a captain, and it was, we were captains and majors. Uh, and all of us were, were older, uh, experienced pilots. And uh, said, no, airplane's in good shape, sir. Hey, I got a problem with, a, with something such and such didn't work. Okay, I'll take a look at it. 20 minutes later, the crew chief's back in the ops officer and says, Captain Bidlack, you want to know why you're split vert, one of your cameras didn't work or one of your fuel pumps didn't work. He said, don't scare me. And he came out, hell, I got bullet holes in the goddamn airplane. <laughs> and and sometimes I knew I was being shot at and sometimes I didn't. We assumed we were being shot all the time. Uh -huh. Now, is there anything else on here that we can show? Uh, well, we flew a lot of missions down in here and these were not counters. They did not count it towards a combat tour. When you flew up here, that that counted as a tour another day in Vietnam. Well, how many combat tours did you have? I had I had a, a hundred and eighty three, two hundred and eighty three total camera, and I had a hundred over North Vietnam missions. But these down here, you could you could have five hundred. It didn't matter because you weren't being shot at. Okay. So so. North of uh, North of Da Nang, that's where, the, and right there it is. And then, then, then we get, and then when we come in and buy out here and get refuel off Hanoi, this is Hainan, uh, and then come in uh, and come back out and punch a tanker and come on back down. When I say punch a tanker, we didn't fly refuel. Uh -huh. Did a lot of in-fly refueling. <clears throat> How long did that take? 10 minutes, 15 minutes. We could you get out, it'd be a, a KC-135 tanker, which is of course the, the Boeing 707. And uh, we'd see him out there 10, 15 miles away. And we knew where he was and where he was supposed to be. And we'd pull up underneath him. And we could, the Voodoo, the RF-101 Voodoo could, was one of the few airplanes that could we could refuel two ways. We could refuel through the boom refueling system that had the big tube, and it would come in across underneath the, their tail and hit behind the cockpit. There was a receptacle, and boom, and, and you could see your fuel tanks fill back up. Um, we could also do it the other way with the, what they called the drogue system. We had the, the probes and we could pull up beside the airplane and slide in and, and punch a drogue and refuel that way. But, but we didn't do that very much. That was phasing out and then we were doing most of it with the tanker with the boom refueling. Uh, was we did there a lot. any and reason I, why they switched? Well, they were still learning how to do it. And so they started out with the old KB-50 bomber and then the, the, KB, the KB-29 and the KB-50. But they weren't fast enough, or we needed a faster airplane for the Voodoo. 
because we were approaching a stall and he was going at red line for the KB-50 tanker. Mm -hmm. So we needed a faster airplane. Well, I remember when the first time I refueled off a KC-135 jet tanker, shit, that was a piece of cake. Just slide over behind him, punch him, and take off three or 4,000 pounds of fuel, and we were head on on the target. Or I flew the, I flew the Pacific twice, solo. Just had my own tanker with me. I sat out there and said, and about every 30 minutes, I'd roll in beside him, top off, and we can run, run across. All the way across the Pacific? Oh, yeah. From where? Well, to... from Sacramento to Honolulu to Guam to Saigon to Vietnam. Mm hmm Yeah. You had a tanker with you all the way? Sometimes we'd land and get another tanker coming out. And, but, yeah, we did a lot of refueling. Ever have any uh, close calls? when you were flying reconnaissance? <laughs> well, define close call. Uh, other than you, get, uh, you, get so, you get to the point where it gets pretty, and then, you, then you're getting kind of dangerous because, because you, didn't, you lose respect for them. And you, and you better be on the front of your seat and, and ready for anything. Uh -huh. So... So how was your weather over there in Vietnam? It had, it had wet season and dry season, but the, but their their dry season was our rainy season. <laughs> but but it was it, there were thunderstorms that could build up over um, Southeast Asia up to fifteen sixty thousand feet. But in a fighter like the Voodoo. We didn't much give a shit about the weather, just fly through it. Really? Because the airplane could handle it. Because the wings not going to come off. It's not like an airliner or something like that. You get, you know, with uh, uh, rough weather. Mm-hmm. Hell, you don't have rough weather in a, in a voodoo. Just because the airplane's got such small wings and so much power. And, uh, and it wasn't unusual for a crew chief, we'd get, go out pre-flight airplane and get in it and, hey, Captain, can you do me a favor? I said, what's that, Sarge? He says, see if you can find a thunderstorm and get my airplane up wash. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. I'd be glad to do it. Just find a rain shower and fly through it. Really? And got a weather, got a what? You know, got a wash job. Uh-huh. You, 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 you wouldn't do that in World War II with a P-51 or a P-47. Sure, sure. I mean, they they were great airplanes, but then they couldn't do what we were doing. So, how were the accommodations uh, at your various bases? How many accommodations? How were your accommodations? I mean, what where, what kind of a facility did you live in? In in Vietnam, <clears throat> outside in Saigon, we rented a villa, and so did other units, Air Force, Navy, Army, staff, and so we had this. Two bedroom or two two floor, four or five bathrooms. There was a big villa, and we rented that with a couple of uh, Vietnamese women that did our laundry and washed our flight suits and made the beds and did breakfast and supper for us. Were they trustworthy? And they what? Were they trustworthy? We never had any trouble. Yeah, but there wasn't a problem. They were they were great people. I'm I'm sure there were some occasions, but never in my outfit there wasn't. So did we? They, had, we we uh, they took good care of us. We'd get up at seven or eight in the morning and have a big breakfast put out with for a dozen pilots or whatever. And then we and also our photo interpreters and our maintenance officers and so forth. And, uh, now the GIs were in barracks on the base, but but the officers uh, and the crew members, we lived in villas in downtown Saigon, and uh, and every Friday night was a big steak night and poker night. In, in the uh, villa. In the villa, and we invite some interesting people. Oh yeah, has some has some good memories, some good buddies. The problem is right now, in my for me, 
And a lot of us is, shit, we're all pushing 90 years old. There ain't any, we're, just, we're losing one every time yeah. I turn around. Yeah. Uh, it used to be if you could go down to Sumter, South Carolina, as Shaw Air Force Base was the home of tactical reconnaissance for 50 years. From the time of the P-51, the F-80, F-80 RF-80, uh, Lockheed, the uh, F-86, the interceptor airplane. Uh, so we, we had all these, uh, for years, was the home of tactical reconnaissance. Well, there, and we'd have our reunions down there, and the last time we got together was 10 years ago. Because hell, they were all dying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, some of the best best friends I ever had in my life were the guys I flew in Vietnam with. Did you lose any of your buddies in Vietnam? Oh, yeah. The first guy I got shot down was Bob Trouble, Trouble Horn. And so uh, it was just, what it was, was he flying? Voodoo. They all, all flying. All. How did he get shot down? S surface to air missile? We don't know. Oh. We don't know. There was a lot of guys we just lost them and didn't know. When we first started going into North Vietnam, we were flying alone. The old adage, the old tactical reconnaissance adage, that alone, unarmed, and unafraid. Well, we said alone, unarmed, and scared shitless. Uh, but Bob Treble was the first guy to, the first 101 driver. But but I can name you pilot after pilot after pilot. It, it's either were POWs or just just never. So. We started flying in the hot missions way up north around Hanoi. We'd go in a two airplane. And that way if somebody got shot down, we'd somebody else could tell you about it. And uh, they'd say, yeah. yeah, I saw Bob jump out. He was ejected out over. Uh, we'd find out three or four months later that he's a POW. Did you ever talk to those guys after being a POW? Oh, talk to them all the time. Not, not until they got released. Right. Yeah, after they got released, we had reunions. Can you tell me any of the stories? I hosted, I hosted uh, twice at the Air Force Museum. Uh, the the voodoo in, Day in Dayton. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the RF one hundred and one voodoo that's in the museum, I flew that airplane in Vietnam. Oh. And they can tell you stories about that, but, but. Uh, well, give me an example of how uh, the pilot retreated when they were. Prisoners of War. It, it make you cry. You had you had these big guys. They just were brought to their knees, and they were there. They were locked up for six and seven years. I, we I had a lot of respect from from my buddies that didn't make it. Mm -hmm. uh, lost lost a lot of good friends. Were there, was there a lot of torturing going on? Uh, depends on who it was, yeah, there, there was. I mean, what do you mean it depends on who it was? Who the, well, who some, the, of, some, some guys fought harder than other guys or raised hell more. Some of them had short fuses and told them to go fuck themselves and, and the others just bit their tongue and, did, and didn't, 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 raise the didn't fuss, get as huh? much problem. Well, now, as far as uh, commendations, you had two uh, distinguished flying crosses uh, with oak leaf clusters, right? Yep. You had a bronze star. What did you get the bronze star for? I don't remember. I what? mean, I really don't remember. I don't, we, you know, I was, I was, uh, there was three of us that were the awards and decorations officers, and when we come back from the mission, and just about every day, Colonel Bryant or Colonel Walker, the guys that were running the squadron, they, and I was one of them. Uh, Joe Kuhlman was the other one, and Joe just passed away three or four months, six months ago. But our one of our jobs, extra duties, is hey Dick, get the details, but write up a, a commendation for Air Medal for for what you know whatever. Mm -hmm. So I just go get some detail and fill out the paperwork. And we and we got to the point where we could. I could write up a district. Come on in. Okay. We're looking for the exit. You're looking for who? The exit. <laughs> so
so uh, so I'd write up the accommodation. Who, who are you looking for? The exit. The exit. The exit. Oh. Uh, so uh, the, D, the DFCs. What what did you get those for? T was flying uh, for flying through some crappy uh, from crappy uh, air to air. You know, getting Sir? shot at and got hit and okay. brought the airplane back. So, where'd you get hit by other than the small arms fires? You get hit by. Well, I remember one time coming back from a mission, I knew I had lost a couple of my cameras. And I said, I, uh, such and such a camera system was not working. I got failure lights in the cockpit. Few minutes later, the crew chief comes in and says, "You want to see why your camera didn't work?" And I said, <laughs> "Okay, what? We we'll go out there, and of course, there's several other people would come on out." And uh, hi, Frank. Um, and said, "I said, holy shit, what happened?" He says, "You got hit by a couple of ground handheld, you know, rifles, and it just went right up through the camera." And, Oh, tore up the inside of the guts of the camera. Oh, shoot. Huh? I said, oh, shoot. Yeah, yeah. oh, hell. Yeah. What are you looking for? Nothing. I'm just getting interviewed. Then you got uh, Air Force commendation. Well, some of it was just from doing other stuff. Just <laughs> job. Well, I just... Uh, <laughs> just just flying all the time, flying every day, and just... Uh, so we might as well get these awards out there, give them away. So, well, uh, you had a Vietnam Service Medal with four bronze stars. Just, just, I can't, I'd have to go through, just, I've got boxes. Just, just being oh, Dick Midnight, and, huh? and Just being Dick. The thing is that um, if you read the, 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 the awards themselves, It'll just say doing a combat mission in 1955, and 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 it was a classified mission, and there wasn't there wasn't anything on, uh -huh. just for a specific, particular. You just you you, you, you they wanted pictures of a, an airfield, or a a pass or a or a bridge or something like that. Well, we didn't give them details. We just said. You hit the target and got good photography, and um, here's an, an air medal. Uh. <laughs> so they 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 were pretty liberal about giving uh, awards out for us, but we were sticking our asses out. So, well, yeah, you're flying over uh, hostile territory, and you no know, ammunition. Well, you were being shot at constantly. Yeah. yeah, and you don't have anything to shoot back with. Yeah, no. Did you ever fly a plane that had we? We kill them with film. But you never, you never flew an airplane uh, over there that had armament. No, I did not in Vietnam. Okay. I flew, I flew with them. Yeah. <clears throat> Let them in on target. I remember several times flying a flight of 105s in, and the old F, the old F4 um, Phantom um, had yeah. had two on each wing. Do you know and what your target you was were over at that the, time? The targets at 12 o'clock in six seconds, and 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and I'm, you know, we're smoking at 600 knots, m below 500 feet. And what what were your uh, compatriots? Were they firing rockets or bombs or what? The guys that the guys I was were, leading, yeah, they were they were doing missiles and rockets and bombs and just all kinds. Of, they had diverse. Load, load, loads on. Did I wasn't in my business. I didn't. That was their problem. Did you lose any guys when you were doing that kind of uh, mission? I don't remember anything any specific, but um, we, I'm sure we did. But I did. But see, after as soon as I hit hit the target and I got pre-strike photography, I'm out of there. You know, and I'm climbing out because they don't need me anymore. How high would you go? How high? How, what, what, what's your highest altitude you flew? Well, the airplane wasn't very good above 50,000 feet, but but we would head out on the deck, and I'd go maybe for 20 or 30 miles, just as fast as I could move on the deck, and then and then and then climb up. And of course, I'm an afterburner. So. And you're moving constantly, moving. 
you didn't want to you, you didn't want to be locking on to something because then they can sure draw easy a target beat, easy target draw a bead on you. So, so when you say you're on the deck, uh, what, what you below talking? below 500 feet. Below 500. Um, 200 feet. Hmm. Um, and, just as fast as that airplane can go. And 600 mile an hour. Well, yeah, uh, uh, one a Mach one is 700 mile an hour. But we were going. The airplane was limited at a at a below 15,000 feet was was point six Mach or something like that. We we could uh, we we in the in the in the there's a pilot's manual right up there that I gave to the squatter to the unit tells about how to fly the RF-101 Voodoo. Um, we 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 would uh, we could go faster. The airplane is going, in, but it's getting real hot in the cockpit. But it just for a few minutes. So we remember. I remember the, the getting hold of uh, McDonnell Douglas aircraft. The airplane was built in St. Louis, the RF-101 Voodoo. And uh, so, how come there's a limit to the airspeed? What's the limit to the airspeed? Uh, he said, "I can, I can, I've still got power left. I'm um, at 600 knots." And they said, "Well, nothing really. We had to give, we had to put a limit on it because the Air Force required us to." But I said, "What's going to happen is you're going to get a lot of com heat of compression on the intakes, and it's going to get real uncomfortable." I said, "I don't give a shit if it's hot or not." I said, "It's going to get hotter if I don't get out of there." Right. And uh, they said, for three or four or five minutes, put up with the heat, and you come out of there ringing wet, but, but, but you're out of there. But, but the airplane could handle it. Later on, the, uh, the F-105 and all the new modern stuff, they're, they're Mach 2 airplanes, but they had variable compression inlays, inlets and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> Uh, we fl flew the airplane as fast as some bitch would go. So where were you when you, uh, well, where were you when you found out you were going to be leaving Vietnam? Oh, I was up in Masala, Japan, because the wife and kids uh, were, were with me. The family was with me. Up in Japan? And they were in Japan. And finally I got my 100 missions and my one year in country because I got and as long as you got over 30 days then it was counted as a counter towards the towards the uh, hundred missions so you try to go to you try to get your hundred missions done and try to get 365 days in country with minimum of 30 days at a time in other words to go in uh, like on a cargo airplane and drop or or passengers off and turn around and fly back over to the Philippines was not considered a combat mission. I'm not saying they weren't needed, but it just wasn't being yeah. shot at. Yeah. So when we f got when we would s get scheduled for a trip to Vietnam, we made sure it was in 30-day increments, minimum. Mm-hmm. And that, and, and also we would get flying, and 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 a, and it didn't count. You could you could fly 500 missions in South Vietnam because you're not getting shot at. But 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 you could get one shot, one flight over North Vietnam, and that was a counter towards the one year and 100 missions. Okay. So you get your we would we would get the 100 missions. And the 365 days at the same time. Yeah. And that wasn't very hard to do. It doesn't sound like it as you much could, as you, you were could, in the air. Because we were flying all the time. Yeah. Uh, usually we didn't fly more than once a day, but sometimes we flew twice a day. But yeah, we stayed busy. And we'd fly maybe for 10 days at a time, get a day off, and then go down and then fly for another 10 days. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, especially if one of those was in North Vietnam, but if, but if you went to Laos, uh, or South Vietnam, it wasn't a counter. 
Because you weren't, supposed you weren't to be being there? shot at. Okay. Okay. So, Jim, you have any questions you want to ask of uh, Dick? In miles per hour, what's the fastest you ever went in the plane? The fastest I was ever went in miles per hour, probably a thousand. A thousand miles an hour. The one on one, yeah. Yeah. That's so. Well, that was 60 years ago. Oh, I understand. Although they're not going that much faster today. Um, yeah, it was it was a fun mission. It was a fun mission to fly the the, the voodoo. That's the reason I that's the reason I volunteered for it and it was the right place at the right time. There were, but but I remember I could probably count on one hand of the. 40 or 50 pilots that I knew that, that flew the voodoo. There weren't that many. There weren't hundreds. There weren't very many of us. Um, and there were there were guys that couldn't couldn't handle it. They just I remember I I throw names down occasionally now because they're not here anymore. But uh, the guys are just they clanked up. No, what do you mean they clanked up? They crank they just. They they just we didn't see him the next day. I said what happened to Bill or Charlie or Jim? I said oh he uh, he had to go home. Oh, uh, we had to send him home. He had to go. Well, I know what happened. He just came unglued, and that happened to a few guys. Yeah, not very many, but it happened to a few. Yeah. If you had to do it over again, would you volunteer to do it? Probably, be stupid enough to do it. Is there anything we haven't talked about that do you think someone would be interested well, in knowing about your career, uh, military know. or otherwise? I don't know. If anybody wants to talk about it, there's, there's nothing classified anymore. <laughs> so we did it. But I got, uh, I had a good, it, if you didn't get shot down, it was a good, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but, uh, but he, but the old pucker factor sometimes. Well, did you did you, any of your buddies get shot down and get rescued, helicopter rescue or anything? A few. Well, there was a few that did, yeah. Uh, and I met a few of them, and, and a lot of them that didn't. Yeah. We still don't know where they are. Yeah. Uh, would you have anything to do with locating those pilots that had been shot down? No, since? because we didn't. There were better ways to do it. Those uh, air rescue helicopters, yeah, they could, they could, uh, they they got pretty good at their job, and and they had uh, those little uh, uh, Douglas piston engine fighters, the old World War II yeah. Korean War uh, ADs, and they could they could come in there and get shot at and all over and still come home, come home. And 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 maybe pick up a pilot. Okay. Um, we you're not gonna be able to pick up a pilot in 101. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> right. But uh, uh. but one guy did. Jerry, what was his name? He was he's gone now, but he he got the, he got the uh, Medal of Honor. Uh, Jerry Fisher, and he Bernie Fisher, Bernie Fisher, and he uh, he landed his AD. Now what was an AD? Navy Navy airplane, but it was called a Navy AD. I can't remember what the Air Force called that. I can't remember. A big, it was a big piston airplane. It's a big single engine piston. I can't remember. Oh, uh, well, he went into. Uh, Somewhere in here, um, and he landed at a three three thousand foot runway, and he landed, and the pilot went running out and jumped in. It was a two a single seat airplane, 
but two pilots got in it uh -huh. and flew out. That airplane sat in the museum at the Air Force Museum. Well, how did he land that? He that, landed that plane on a two, three thousand foot. No, runway. no, he it was a piston airplane. It was slow. Oh, okay. And, and it was a three thousand foot runway, and he landed. The guy came running out and jumped on the wing and jumped in the cockpit with the canopy open, and they took off. They got shot up, but they baited out. Good. And Bernie Fisher, he, he was the father of ten or a dozen kids. Uh, I got to know, I got to meet him several times. Okay. And uh, and he he made it out. And he survived the war. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, we've been here a good long time. Thank you for doing this interview, and thank you for your service. Yeah, well, thank you. I, yeah.